And today, well, we have, um, well, the big, big news of today, of course, is that Creality has released the K1. Uh, the K1 is a Core XY printer. That is a Creality's answer to the Bamboo Labs printers. Um, it's got 600 millimeters per second print speed. Uh, there's two versions. There's a 220 by 220 by 250 mil uh, one that's available for $699. And the $1,000 one or $999 one is 300 by 300 by 300 meters. It's called the Max. Uh, there's a LiDAR for the first layer. There's an AI camera for error detection. It's kind of ringing to reduce this moiré effect, or ringing reduction to reduce this moiré effect we hate. Uh, there's a ceramic heater um, that uh, encloses the hot end. Uh, there's better ducting of uh, air across the model, so better laminar airflow, which would improve the, the layer, uh, the surface quality, and also the optics of your model, and may even reduce warpage and uh, some other problems as well, because that could be really good. Uh, there's a 1.2 gigahertz CPU, there's better software, kind of more of a Creality experience, including apps and, and, and slicing and all this kind of stuff. And this is just the most important printer uh, of the year, apart from like then the, 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 the last printer, which is, a, <clears throat> of course, Prusa's i4. Um, now, the i4 was the, the, the big printer from Prusa. It's an evolution. It's a better than the i3. It saw all of the improvements that we wanted to see, really. Uh, and all the ones we, 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 we kind of could have imagined uh, if we placed ourselves in Prusa Research's uh, offices and we could have imagined ourselves, then we would have come up with a pretty similar printer, I think, most of us. So it's a great printer, or it looks like a great printer, we have to find out, of course. And, um, well, we'll see uh, if that makes an impact. Now, of course, the i3, the, the one before that, is the... Uh, the major uh, architecture of nearly all the open source printers and has sold millions of printers uh, 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 worldwide and the clone armies have sold millions as well. Um, so that architecture is very predominant and now we're seeing another architecture emerge. This is the Core XY architecture and it was kickstarted by a full featured everything but the kitchen sink 3D printer from, uh, uh, from Bamboo Labs which employs a lot of things that other people hadn't really thought of or hadn't really developed, like a, kind of like a, a vibration mitigation uh, kind of software, for example. Uh, you know, smart things. And it became a fully featured, very fast printer uh, at a $1,000 price point that could wipe out everything else. And that's the difference. Like before this, people have been competing. They've looked at this guy's printer and said, oh, we need a little bit better specs at a little bit lower price. And what Bamboo Lab said, you know what? What do we need to do to destroy everybody? Right? From, uh, you know... Ultimaker all the way down to Anet and Creality. What do we need to destroy them all? And that's what they did. And they must have gotten an awful lot of money, by the way, from someone to be able to do that. Um, uh, and they did, you know, up until so far, they did a really good job. So this is the, one of the biggest players in the market, Creality's answer to that, the K1. And, you know, these are very different printers. These are much more usable printers. They could really define the future. Now, they're Core XY, right? <clears throat> They have a lot of AI and other features that seem a little bit silly, but really would help your experience. There's a lot more of the proprietary software. So rather than using like, um, you know, Thingiverse and then and then all these kind of open kind of tools that are accessible to anyone, like Thingiverse and Cura and things like that, these guys are all developing their own software now for these printers to more tightly controlled, more control of the experience from file sharing to slicing and, and, and apps and monitoring and everything like that. So all of a sudden, these open these clone army three D printer companies now also have to become software companies, which is going to be very difficult. Now, what does this kind of stuff mean for Marlin? Right? What does it mean for ramps and all these controller boards? What does it mean for that kind of open ar architecture that we've all been using? Does that mean that'll fall by the wayside? And does it also mean that certain companies that have been making pretty darn good printers so far, but don't have software teams, are they going to fall by the wayside as well? Now we can really. Imagine like, I don't know if this is going to be a great printer. I don't, also don't know if the, you know, if the Bamboo Labs carbon stuff, are they are going to hold up, right? But imagine five years from now, Creality has worked on the K5 or whatever. Um, uh, you know, there's the Carbon Max Gold Edition, whatever, the, 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 the evolution of Bamboo Labs printers. Imagine these printers. Imagine how good they'll be. Because what we're seeing on the carbon uh, on the bamboo lab printers is better yield, better uptime, better reliability, uh, and we're seeing better usability as well. So we're seeing something that you know it's not consumer friendly. I wouldn't give it to someone and say, "Hey, I want to print stuff today," and I'm like, eh, "You need a little bit more 
there. But imagine five years from now with better software, with just a gradual evolution of these printers. Then we could see something that is truly consumer friendly, right? Not something that you have to learn how to do, not something you have to put a couple hundred hours in until you understand it. No, no, like push button printing, one click printing. And that could really change everything because that means that that printer model for a thousand bucks would be attractive for people who well, instead are thinking of buying something for 200. But if they get much higher yield, much better reliability, and that's proven, then they'll skip to this printer. Same thing with print farms. What about universities, right? Imagine they, they have a choice of getting like a mid-market printer for 3K or they get 3K ones or K5s or whatever they're called then. Right? Or they got three uh, bamboo printers. Or imagine a, a business. Like, well, yeah, the Ultimaker S7 or whatever is a great printer, but we can get 10 of these for the same price. Right, right now, a business would be tempted to get the S5 and S7 from Ultimaker because they're more reliable, they're more trusted, better support, all that kind of stuff. So there'll be a lot that these guys have to do in order for them to, to kind of shape up with that. But they don't have to be as good, right? Because again, uh, if they're just about as good and you can get seven printers or 10 printers for the price, then a lot of businesses are going to be like, well, we'll get 10 of these. If they maybe break a little bit more, whatever, we still have more printing capacity. Imagine a print farm. You're just trying to print things. You'll, you'll, you'll move away from your custom printer or your i3s or whatever, and then you'll go to, to one of these models. So this is really, really important. And this is really going to make or break a lot of companies in this market and also a lot of this open source infrastructure that we all use. Um, you know, maybe a couple of years from now, you know, a Marlin won't be viable or uh, all these controller boards will be gone and we'll just be using other kind of infrastructure. And maybe a lot of players get wiped out by this because they just don't have the, the, the knowledge of 3D printing software and of, of crafting the experience. And, or maybe, you know, this is just, these are just going to be a huge successful printers. That could be the case, but I really think this is really, really very, very important. And then, and we've seen some important releases from Prusa and now from Creality, and it's going to be everyone's chance to step up uh, or just, you know, or step out of the market, essentially. This K1 needs to be like a KO, <laughs> right? Or, uh, if it's just okay, it could make or break uh, Creality, let's say. But if Creality makes something that's credible as an alternative to the, 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 the Bamboo Labs printers, it's going to get resellers, it's going to get attention, it's going to get volume, and it's going to be able to present a market space where it's making printers that are five times more expensive than the ones it typically sells. So big, big day for Creality and a big, big day for the rest of us as well. The next thing is a 3D printed bridge in India. Um, there's a lot of excitement about 3D printed houses, right? Um, I'm not that excited about that because people are designing with, uh, well, there's this thing called Stoffwechsel, which is they're designing for the old technology using 3D printing. So until they start designing for 3D printing, until we start seeing like more igloo-like houses or optimized for 3D printing, it, the, the, the real advantages aren't going to be unlocked. And I don't see in the near term a lot to be gained there. But imagine bridges. Imagine things like uh, septic tanks. Imagine bunker silos, stormwater basins, uh, culverts, all this kind of stuff. There, I really see a huge, huge opportunity, especially for the developing world and also in, well, in kind of the developed world. In Europe, for example, we saw a lot of building at the Marshall Plan. A lot of that uh, kind of post-World War II, 60s, 70s, 80s infrastructure is now crumbling. Labor is more expensive. Labor is scarce. And so I think, you know, replacing all these bridges and foot bridges and bicycle bridges and all these other things in the developed world is going to be a huge opportunity for 3D printing much more so than houses and much immediately and much faster because you can print these things much faster, make much more money out from them, right? Because you can do a thousand of these. This is this bridge, for example, is a pedestrian bridge. It's a two hour print, two hours. You've got a product, boom, you cure it, of course, and all this, but, uh, but, but the actual asset is only being used for two hours and you have a sellable product. You can truck to the location. In the developing world, I really think, imagine you have a printer and the printer goes to one particular province in India and then prints all the infrastructure they need there and then gets trucked into the location and then it goes to the next province. Imagine how cheap and effective it will be to bring new infrastructure, new kind of water and sewage and, um, and road infrastructure uh, and transport infrastructure to, to these areas. So I think this is really important. So I'm much more, I'm like the only person, but I'm like much more excited about this kind of infrastructure stuff than houses. I know houses works for the media, but I just think this is much more important. Anyway, about this thing, by the way, before I uh, talk about other stuff, this is a small bridge. It's a pedestrian bridge. It was developed by uh, Professor KVL Subramaniam uh, and the research team around him, or, well, or her, I don't, I don't know, actually. Um, anyway, that person. 
and at the Department of Civil Engineering at IIT Hyderabad. Uh, it was made in uh, 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 together with Simpliforce Creations. This is kind of interesting. Actually. Usually we see companies um, be kind of like uh, dedicated 3D printing companies. Simpliforce Creations is a reseller of all, and they do services that are kind of like everything 3D printing shop. So maybe in some markets that actually makes sense. And then for some markets, you know, in most markets, we're seeing a sharp delineation between metal, polymer, and now also construction. We're seeing a you know, parallel infrastructure emerge and resellers and markets and stuff. Hey, but these simple forge creations guys like, we'll do everything, it's fine. So I think that's really interesting to note. Anyway, it was printed in two hours. Uh, they're doing load testing. They're trying to get like approvals. They're also look, looking to use topology to optimization to minimize the amount of concrete used in it. Um, and the idea is that they trucked it to site already and they're testing it. So I think it's a wonderful development and it's a much larger development, I think, than people realize. Uh, another thing is Zellerfeld in, and Pangea, I think, uh, have released the Absolute Sneaker. Uh, this uh, uh, is a $250 TPU 3D printed sneaker. Uh, so I think we can all agree that it's a very profitable, it's gonna be a wonderfully profitable one thing. It's gonna, this, this thing costs maybe like five, uh, uh, $20, let's say at the most, but but it won't be $20. But, um, uh, <laughs> but so this is a fantastically profitable thing, so it's wonderful. Now. Is it comfortable? I don't know. It looks a lot better than the previous LFL sneakers. The print quality is much better. It looks a lot cooler, I think. This is something that I think there are people I know that could wear this. I don't know if it's going to be, I've worn things similar to this, and I'm not entirely sure if that's going, this is going to be very comfortable because it, it kind of the, the TPU material here is uh, going to um, yeah, retain a lot of heat and it's going to not wick properly. So it's not going to be comfortable in my mind, but Maybe they get it right. And and I think what the wonderful thing about Zellerfeld is they really know how to communicate their vision and to get attention for it compared to us 3D printing nerds who suck at that kind of stuff. Right? So what they're saying here is that this material is TPU and that it's a mono material and it can be melted down at the end of life. And because it's made of one material and not 40, they say of over 40 materials in regular shoes, it can be as much as 120, by the way. It's crazy. Um, uh, but because it's made out of this one material, it's much easier to recycle. It's kind of tricky to recycle TPU, but it can be done. And their idea is really for this to be a circular product. And because it is just made of one thing, you can just bring it back to the store and get a new one made. And I love that vision of just coming from, hey, we just printed on a desktop printer um, a, a using TPU. Uh, we printed a shoe and now saying, no, no, this is like a more environmentally friendly, less waste uh, producing thing. So the vision thing that Zellerfall does is really, really much, much superior than, than, than nearly everyone in our industry communicating that. So I think that's something we should need. We should, pay attention to also i really don't think this well, I kind of this could work but what will totally work is a slipper i don't know if you know we, we talked about them a while back asics made a slipper out of this kind of uh material i think that kind of uh, a cellular slipper made with uh, on an hp machine uh using pa11 or kind of uh, maybe even a carbon slipper or a slipper made on a desktop machine with tpu that is the advantage then you've got a really comfortable slipper that's cool 3d printed slipper and that's going to be something you can wear every day if you want to and so to me the the the, the shoe thing is really cool we know that it's it, it uh, and people are interested in it fashion brands are interested in it but to me if you want a wearable shoe let's look at slippers <laughs> that to me is, is, is a much more immediate goal and much more immediately uh, achievable comfortable footwear thing anyway so that was it for today uh, thank you so much for your time uh, and uh, have a nice